Thank you everyone for coming along. Uh, I don't really need to do much of an introduction. Robert Llewellyn, famous for all sorts of uh, things. Brighton Red Dwarf, 10 years of Scrap Heap Challenge, yes. um, a multitude of other things. So um, please welcome Robert. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Very kind of you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm hope, hopefully what I'm going to tell you will be mildly interesting or even relevant to what you're doing because uh, uh, I think you're, you're I'm very envious of you because I think you're living in very exciting times it's a challenging difficult com confusing but it's quite exciting and I'll just, I was, I was just sort of thought I'll do a very brief potted history of how I ended up doing what I do um, because it wasn't written in the stars or in anywhere else uh, in fact if anything you know it's, it's, it's a big surprise to me that I've ended up doing what I do so I was, uh, grew up very near here, just the other side of Oxford. I was expelled from school when I was 16. I was uh, told by my very brutal and violent headmaster that I wouldn't even be good enough to be a dustman, uh, which is very encouraging, very academic school. It was Henry Box uh, School in Whitney. It was a grammar school when I was there. Uh, uh, it's now changed to a lovely school, and I was invited back a couple of years ago to give prizes uh, out at speech day, and I said, have you looked at the school records? <laughs> and the new headmaster, who's lovely and could probably be about the right age to be my son, uh, said, we just won't mention that. So, uh, and it's a fantastic school now, so it's very different. But it was a very different world that I grew up in. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no clue. Um, I was a hippie. I, had, I could sit on my own hair uh, by going like that. I don't mean like... Anyway, it was long. <laughs> I lived in a commune, a real proper commune in the Welsh mountains for a while. Uh, and did all sorts of daft things, got in trouble, uh, got out of trouble. Lived a very uh, law-abiding life since then. Um, uh, but when, about the age of uh, 22, I was uh, involved in a, a, a craft community in East London. And I can't even begin to describe to you why, but I was. And uh, I used to make shoes. I did an apprenticeship as a shoemaker, and I made shoes for really rich people who I didn't like. Uh, as a, a shoe company, it still exists, uh, who make the Queen's riding boots and Prince, Prince, all those people's shoes, called John Lobbs. They're on, in St. James in London, very posh shoe shop. And I worked in the basement underneath with a lot of Eastern European uh, concentration camp survivors. So very educational. Uh, <laughs> That's a whole other story. While I was doing that, I was, I want, what I didn't want to do was have a job. I didn't want to work for someone else and have a job. That was my main intention. And being a shoemaker meant that I could work on my own uh, as an outworker, it was called then, as a freelancer. Uh, so that's what I did for a few years. But I knew it wasn't really what I wanted to do. And all the people I worked with knew it wasn't what I wanted to do because they couldn't get me to shut up. I tended to talk quite a lot while I was making shoes. During this time, I got involved with this little group of people and we put on a cabaret. And I wanted to sort of organise it and direct it and write jokes for it and do things like that. And then I ended up on stage uh, in abject terror. I really didn't want to do it. I'd never done drama at school. I'd never done acting. I didn't want to, I wasn't interested. Uh, but I did this show and I said things out to an audience and they laughed. And it was a kind of life-changing experience, a very peculiar uh, experience. And out of that, I, I became a member. Of, I founded a, a theatre company, a comedy theatre company in 1979. That's how long ago it was, um, in London, and we, uh, that sort of became very successful. And this was at the same time, we kind of came out of the same um, group as people like the young ones, like uh, Aid Edmondson, Rick Mayle, uh, Nigel Planer, who's become a very good friend of mine, uh, Alexi Sale, Ben Elton, all those people. Ben Elton was a student uh, and when we were uh, first gigging, and he used to do the warm-up for the Joeys, which was the group I was in. And then he went on. He wasn't that successful afterwards. Uh, um, so it was, a, it was a very exciting sort of explosive period of, of uh, comedy stuff. It was called alternative comedy then. We were anti-racist, anti-sexist comedians. That's what we were on stage. Off stage, I won't even begin to describe. But we were trying. We were thinking about it and we were talking about it. And that went on for five years. I did that till 1985 when the group imploded and we all fell out with each other. We're now friends again. Uh, but out of that, I then got commissioned by... Channel 4 uh, to do uh, a, a sitcom uh, out of the, some of the characters that we used to do on stage. So we, we wrote a sitcom for Channel 4 and at this time there were three incredibly successful uh, live performing groups. There was a group called Pookie Snackenberger uh, who uh, did a very lively musical act uh, and they went, some of those people went on to form a group called Stomp, you might have heard of now. Another group was called Cliffhanger 
a theatre group that did weird, surreal plays. And one of the members of that group went on to work with a man called Rowan Atkinson uh, on a series called Mr Bean. So he did quite well. And then out of my group, uh, <laughs> we wrote the, this sitcom. I mean, all three of those groups got commissioned to make television series. Now, if you'd seen them on stage, you'd think, these are brilliant. These people are fantastic. They're so funny. They're so talented. They're so multifaceted. They do amazing music or wonderful plays or really funny sketches and songs. And if you then saw the television stuff they produced, it was some of the most diabolically shite television that has ever been produced. It was unspeakably bad. And we have, it's still to this day, have discussions when we ever meet up about whose was worse. I think the one we did was absolutely uh, diabolically appalling. It was called The Corner House. Um, and it was an incredibly painful experience making it. So we'd gone from this amazingly successful life as live performers to making these TV series. The Cliffhangers show was, it was rubbish, but I don't think, I think ours was worse. Pookie Snackenberger, who were absolutely stunning when you saw them live, their TV show was unimaginably rubbish. You know, it wasn't even first year media students experimental film with sideways cameras and wobbly shots and bad sound. Much worse than that. And they'd been paid loads of money to make it on Channel 4. So it was quite an extraordinary and very brutal experience to, to learn this. Um, and one of the things that stayed with me when I was thinking, I hadn't thought about it for years, but we wrote this script and it was called The Last Straw. And the, uh, that was the series title. And uh, the cafe that this uh, sitcom was set in was called The Last Straw Cafe. And we wanted to play with all the traditional role models. So instead of having a gay waiter and a straight, grumpy owner of the cafe, we had a grumpy, gay owner of the cafe and a straight waiter. And I was the straight waiter. And my friend, uh, who I worked with for many years in the Joeys and afterwards, uh, Chris Amard, was, was gay. And he played the gay owner of the cafe, who was a bit grumpy. And the fireman was gay and the plumber was a woman and my best friend was black and we were so politically correct it was painful, painful. And we, we did a lot of sit but absolutely no com. It was about as funny as a wet weekend in Wheatley. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't a lot of fun. So that was really painful and I ran for cover. After we'd done it, I went to America and stayed with friends as far away from England as I could. I stayed in Los Angeles and while I was there, I met a, a screenwriter, a real screenwriter who actually got paid to write scripts for films. And uh, some of his best friends were special effects people uh, who did exploding things. And they said, come along to the movies. And I went to the movies with them, not knowing, and didn't met, met, never met these people before. Went to Man's Chinese Theatre, which is a very famous old cinema on uh, Sunset Boulevard in, in Hollywood. And there was a red carpet and there were lights. And as we walked up, um, Jack Nicholson got out of a stretch limo and walked up the red carpet. And then we walked up the red carpet. Uh, not that near him. He didn't, I didn't meet him. And he didn't look at us. Uh, and we went to see a movie, a pre the premiere of a movie called Robocop. And the people I was staying with had built Robocop's right leg. That was their special thing. They were, did special effects. So uh, if you haven't seen the film, you haven't missed much, to be honest. But there is a scene where Robo's leg opens and he's got a huge gun inside his leg because he's a robot. I was fascinated by it. I've always been a little bit uh, obsessed with robots. And it was a, a, it's a funny movie, uh, uh, very sort of violent. And so I came back with this sort of daft notion that I wanted to write... Uh, a stage play about a robot that wasn't violent, about a robot that was, was quite pleasant and uh, tried, to be, tried to blend in with the, the rest of the human race uh, and was designed by a woman. So the play was called Mammon, Robot Born of Woman. Now when I say that, I've got the poster of it up in my office and when I say it out loud, I'm hugely embarrassed. But at the time, in the late 1980s, this was very cutting edge stuff. So it was about a robot that was... Uh, that, was, that was designed to help this woman make money in the stock exchange. He was meant to be looking like a yuppie, so I had a very uh, classy yuppie suit, red braces, and a giant phone. This robot didn't have uh, wireless communication. He still had to have the phone. It was a fake one. But it, and, and it's so hard to explain when I look at the age of some of you. The fact that they really were prats who looked like me but had a massive phone the size of a house brick, and they'd walk around talking on them, and they'd go, yeah, Let's buy that now. I mean, they were such monstrous tossers. It's hard to imagine that. <laughs> and the, the, if you said to somebody then, do you think mobile phones will catch on to the average person? You go, are you kidding? Have you seen them? They're so naff. Anyway, so I did that play. 
did that at the Edinburgh Festival in 1988. And it was immediately commissioned by Channel 4 to be a sitcom. And I went, wow, that's much better. Now I've got control of this. I can do this the way I want to do it. And so I started writing that. But at the same time, one of the people who came to see the show, I, I'm just going to show off about the show for a minute. It was amazing. It did incredibly well. It was nominated for a Perry Award. You could not get tickets to get in. It was sold out from day one. It was a smash hit. We didn't win the Perry Award. <laughs> a man called Jeremy Hardy won that year. Uh, uh, it's got nothing to do with the fact that my uh, co-performer was a black American woman. Nothing to do with that at all, although there were scurrilous rumours going around about that at the time. Um, uh, it, but anyway, it was great fun. We did it, then we did it in London. And when we, when we were doing it in London, a man came along to see it, a, a man called Paul Jackson, who is a TV producer, who produced a uh, bizarre sci-fi quirky comedy show called Red Dwarf. And he said, do you want to be in Red Dwarf? And I said, no, what are you talking about? I don't, I want to, I'm going to be a writer. I want to be like W.H. Auden and wear a tweed jacket with leather over patches and smoke a pipe and think about big thoughts. And he said, yeah, well, come and meet the writers of Red Dwarf. And I did. I went to meet the writers of Red Dwarf and I got on with them. Uh, they were really funny. They're really wonderful people. Uh, uh, they were sitting behind a desk when I was talking to them and I was doing my robot walks for them. Um, uh, to show them how a robot would work, because they were talking about Crichton the robot and all that sort of stuff. And I was telling them how I based one of my walks on Douglas Bader, who was a famous World War II fighter pilot who lost both his legs. So he had a very peculiar, and he had false legs. And he had a very peculiar walk, and he walked like that. And it was, I was doing all my clever robot walking for them. And then Doug Naylor, one of the writers of Red Dwarf, got up and walked over to me like this, because he's only got one leg. So I thought, there we go, I've finished that. There's no way I'm ever going to get a job with them. <laughs> been taking the piss out of people with one leg and there we go but they did and I the, the thing I said and they do remind me of it occasionally is I said I don't I'm not sure I want to be in Red Dwarf because I don't want to be typecast as a robot because I was making this thing for Channel 4 about a robot and then I'd be on the BBC as a robot and I didn't want to be typecast as a robot 25 years later when we're still making Red Dwarf those words do haunt me every now and then um, uh, but so, uh, uh, but the main thing was, the big thing that was stopping me doing it was because I didn't want to do other people, I didn't want to have a job, I didn't want to do other people's work, but I eventually my wife uh, bullied me into it because she said, it's only a short job, you can do your other naff stuff at the rest of the time. And she was right, because it, Red Dwarf is a very intensive, incredibly uh, overwhelming experience for about eight or ten weeks a year. Uh, so the rest of the time, you're not having to go to work, and so you can do your own stuff. So it was an amazing thing. I'm glad I said yes now. I don't regret it. Um, it was a, a great experience to be in. Um, uh, but during that time, so the first 10 years uh, uh, after I started working on Red Dwarf, I, I was never uh, recognised in the street. No one ever came up to me and said, some, every now and then someone, people come up to me and go, aren't you that bloke? That was about as much as it was. Aren't you that bloke? Are you that bloke? And I'd always say, no, no, I'm not. I'm a plumber. Uh, uh, but then I, um, I got involved with doing uh, some <laughs> programs for the Open University because I was always interested in engineering and science but just too stupid to actually do it. So uh, my brother is an engineer, uh, he works in automotive, uh, works in, he builds Formula One cars, he's quite clever with metal. Uh, and uh, he, uh, so, a um, bit of a log jam there. <laughs> Uh, I'll come back though. So uh, all that time I was trying to do other things while I was doing Red Dwarf. So I was writing books and writing plays that never got off the ground. I wrote hundreds of scripts for the television, some of which got commissioned. I got commissioned by the BBC to write a drama series which I wrote, which they paid me for, which never got made. I wrote a drama series, a drama, uh, comedy drama uh, one-off for the BBC which got read by properly really famous, really well-known actors who read it wonderfully and it was ever so funny and everybody thought it was brilliant and it never got made. A huge frustration of trying to do something else um, all the time which was very uh, disconcerting. And during that time the internet was just starting to kind of become a thing. And I had a web page, which, again, like my first sitcom, my first web page was one of the naffest, most ineffective web pages you've ever seen, because none of the links worked, and the pictures were crushed in the wrong way, so that people were either 18 feet tall and an inch wide, or massively, you know. And then you'd reload it and recode your HTML. And I can't do that. But luckily I knew some people who did, and it gradually got a bit better. And what was bizarre was I had no idea, because I just got you know, people just say, you've got to have a web page, man, because everybody will go there. The first year I had that web page, it had one and a half million individual hits, which was, at that time, staggering. I mean, I went, who are these people? What are they doing? Because it was so boring. There was nothing on it at all. A picture of Crichton. Ooh, that was about it, really. Um, 
<coughs> but out of that came an, an interest in uh, putting video on online because I just started to see people starting to do it. You could put a tiny little video clip about the size of a postage stamp and using a 14.4 kilobit dial-up modem, if you could wait an hour and a half, you could download almost a minute of a video like that big. It was tiny and it could just about, oh God, and if you listen, can I hear something? And it was just appallingly bad. But it was sort of, there was a hint in that that I thought, this is interesting. I, I was quite excited by that. And I eventually went to, uh, uh, was asked to speak at a conference in 1999 in Los Angeles, which was organized by Apple. So I'd done some talks for Apple in this country. And uh, they had this conference about online video and the, the revolution that was going to happen. And it really did sound as naff as you can imagine. It, he went, it's never going to People have to dial up. And, and it takes hours. You can't watch video on the Internet. It's never going to happen. You know, that was the, the general consensus, particularly in the TV industry. Uh, but then it started to get more possible. And the... the the, the big change, I think, was the, was the technology. So when I first did that, my really terrible, appalling sitcom, I helped edit it. I was very interested in that side of the process. And we used an offline edit suite that belonged to the production company we worked with that cost uh, over £180,000 for this edit suite. And you could do a thousand times more on a really rubbish smartphone now than that edit suite could do. This was two VHS tape machines on top of each other and you had to go to, to try and find the point that you wanted to cut and it would miss it and it was just appallingly bad. But that was state of the art. That was the most exciting video editing suite you could possibly have. By the time, by 1999, I had a, a Mac Pro with Final Cut one probably on it, I don't know what it was, which just about worked. I mean, it would cough and, and wheeze and it would freeze and everything would go wrong and you'd lose all the footage you'd in, ingested and all that stuff. And the, the camera wouldn't recognise the computer and the computer wouldn't... Uh, all those incredible pain in the ass things that we don't have to worry about anymore. But I started to do some, some video editing at home, which was just unimaginable at the time. And through that, through the sort of connections I was making, I formed a company in uh, 2000, I hope I'm getting, the, I'm getting the years roughly right. A, a company called BWebB, British Web Broadcasting. And it, this was going to be online TV. And it was very exciting. And we, we got interviewed by The Guardian. And we had a picture in Mac User Magazine. And we were really excited. And we, and we, did, we got people like Nigel Planer and, and all sorts of performers. Phil Cornwell, who some of you may know, did some very funny stuff. And we recorded like two-minute little comedy things, which we then uploaded onto the BWebB site. It was very exciting. And then people would dial in on their modems from their very crude, lumpy laptops and wait for three and a half hours for this tiny little bit of comedy to download which they'd then watch. And that was the problem, because we were paying for the bandwidth. So every time someone watched one of our comedy clips, it cost us money. So the more people that watched it, that was the big problem, because it, got, it became quite successful. And hundreds of thousands of people found this, because there was nothing else like it around at the time. It's hard to, to explain this, but there wasn't any. And so we suddenly had bandwidth bills of tens of thousands of pounds, and with no income. And we had to shut it down. <laughs> it just wasn't. And we went, this doesn't work. Online, to online video is a complete load of guff. During that time, I started doing Scrappy Challenge. So I had another te normal telly job. But I got very interested in the cameras we were using. We used cameras on Scrappy that we called suicide cameras, which were literally like little lipstick sized cameras, which they'd strap on machines. And those would then, you know, they would be just often destroyed. You'd often find them if we'd done a test on a runway, you'd find a smashed bit of plastic on the ground. And that was a, a suicide camera that had committed suicide. Um, uh, so, uh, so I was clearly drawn to that side. And I would always be found hanging around with the sound men or the cameramen uh, on that show for years. Uh, and during that time, all these things happened. And YouTube was launched in, the, in about, I think it's 2000, somebody will know. When was YouTube launched? 2000. 2005. So I, so, and I signed up very quickly to YouTube because I suddenly went, oh my God, you don't have to pay the bandwidth bill. You can put video up there and you don't have to pay for it. This is bonkers. This won't last 10 minutes, but I'll have a go. So I started using YouTube in the most naff way possible. I think I actually did because I'd seen some teenage girls doing, singing along with, um, uh, you know, pop popular musical acts of the period I can't remember any of them I did I did I can't believe I did it I think it's been taken down by YouTube thankfully um, uh, uh, the Led Zeppelin playing rock and roll with me miming along with it with a uh, uh, tennis racket it's just it was fun <laughs> Thousands and thousands of people watch that, which is really embarrassing. 
but during that time, I then started to think about how, how you could do something on this new medium that was different and how you could start to, how you could do it. I just, it took years. It wasn't overnight by any means. But one of the things I got from Scrappy was a couple of old, uh, I bought them secondhand, old lipstick cameras, suicide cameras. And they're just a tiny little camera with a little box, and you couldn't tell where they were pointing. You couldn't even tell if it was upside down the right way because you couldn't see it. There was no screen to, to see what you were doing. So there were a lot of very embarrassing uh, experiments I did with them. But I put them in the car once and stuck them in the, in the, well, on little sucker mounts in the front of the car. And I drove my son, who's a skate now 20-year-old, but then a 14-year-old skateboarding a young man with chronic Tourette's. Um, I blame his mother. He's, he's not, he hasn't got Tourette's. He's just got occasional blasts of incredible obscene words. So I can't show this video, but it is quite amusing for me as a dad of me just listening to my son swearing at trees, horses, dry stone walls, cottages. Just things that annoyed him, you know, where he grew up in the Cotswolds. Um, but what, what was interesting was when we first got in, you can tell that we're both sort of showing off, if you like, to the camera. And then we start driving. And then after about 10 minutes, we both completely forgot. I've totally forgotten it's there. We don't, they're not like big cameras with lights. They're tiny little things in the corner. You just forget. So we had this quite interesting and very revealing conversation uh, you know, about his mum, basically. And that it was all her fault because she's Australian and she swears all the time. And he can't help it. Fuck off, you bastard. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really the nice version. Um, uh, but what, that was a really interesting thing. And I went, wow, that, that's interesting because we're not worried about because fathers and sons particularly 14 year olds they don't want to talk to their dads but when you're not but they're not looking at him he wasn't looking at me he was looking out the window he was swearing at cottages and I wasn't looking at him because I was driving so it made the conversation much easier and it just kind of clicked that the technology had arrived the way of distributing it arrived and the 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 way I could do this had arrived and so I then did another experimental test with these cameras because they were very very wobbly they would the batteries would run out the cards would fill the whole thing was on a knife edge so I wanted to do a slightly longer version so I drove into London with my wife and put them in the car and she was driving and all she says is why have you got fucking cameras here what are you going to do with this who are you going to show it to you tosser I hate you why did I marry you you've ruined my life normal loving conversation between a husband and wife uh, <laughs> But that was very interesting. Again, that will never be released, but I watch it every now and then because it's, again, very, very revealing. Uh, but So that I then experimented and I did, uh, gave a lift to Ed Bai, who is uh, the director of Red Dwarf. He's also, he directed Bottom. He directed loads of stuff. He's a brilliant man, uh, an extraordinary um, saint, really, in my eyes, because he's also married to Ruby Wax, which in itself is a challenge. Uh, I mean, she's a lovely, wonderful, incredibly intelligent, but barking mad woman. Uh, and I say that with enormous amounts of affection for her. But uh, so he's lived with her for many years. They have three children. The children are staggeringly and wonderfully normal. And how they've come out of that house like that is just amazing. I think it's got quite a lot to do with Ed. Uh, I'm telling you far too much about Ed and Ruby. I shouldn't be so rude about them, but they are they're lovely. And he, so I gave him a lift and he, I gave him a lift to the 24 hour party shop in Notting Hill to buy balloons for his daughter's, uh, I think, 14th birthday or something like that. And all we did was drive to this shop in heavy London traffic with these little cameras on. And he told me things I didn't even know. You don't have those conversations. I said, when did you, I didn't even know how you started. And when did you? And he worked with Morecambe and Wise. He worked with the two Ronnies. He'd worked with all these amazing people in his youth when he was first started. It was great. And I, and I sort of cut it together as crudely as I could at the time. I tried to make it look like a show. Put a little title sequence on. Put a little end sequence on. Put a bit of music on it uploaded it to, at that time, iTunes. So I used a service called Blip TV, which is a, a company I met in, when I was in America, who, who run this service, which is like, it's like Vimeo or uh, YouTube. Uh, because at the time, you could only put, I think, five minutes on YouTube or 10 minutes. And this was like 20 minutes long. Uh, and uh, I, so I couldn't put it on YouTube. So I put it on iTunes. And I had some help from a, a company I still work with, a company called Channel Flip in London, who do online video, the people who run that. And I said, how do I, how do I make it see the iTunes feed on the RSS feed? On the and it was like doing HTML with the bad pictures again. I thought this is going to be a disaster, but they talked me through it. I got it there, and on a Friday night, I checked it, and I went on iTunes, and there it was. I could see it. It was on iTunes, brilliant. And there it was there, and it had two views, and one was me and one was Will, who helped me at Channel Flip. And then we went away for the weekend, and when I came back 
on the Monday morning and I checked my email and I went, oh yeah, what's anybody, oh yeah, I must check that that's still working. And over five and a half thousand people had watched it. Now I hadn't told anyone. There was no Twitter. There was nothing. I don't know how that happened, but somehow people had found that thing on iTunes and watched it and gone, this is brilliant. Told their mates. Somehow it had spread that quickly, and that was really this sort of jump. It was, it was how, the, how the hell does this system work? Because there's no uh, advertising campaign, there was no commercials in the backs of magazines, there was no trailers, because there was nothing to put trailers on. There was nothing. It just happened. And that grew incredibly fast. So then I was producing a show, that show every week. And I did 89, or it's either 89 or 92 episodes on my own, completely on my own. So for each episode, say 20 emails, 15 phone calls, uh, the, the actual recording of it and the editing of it and the uploading of it, that was a piece of piss. Organising it with someone like me who can forget what time it is, day it is, anything, was very complicated. Getting to people's houses, picking them up, driving them to where they wanted to go, dropping them off was uh, a, a challenge, but it was f fabulous fun. Um, and the people who said they would do it were, were amazing. I mean, Sir Patrick Stewart, who, who I didn't expect to, who I, I'd never met, I had no contact with, but the man who fixes my computers at my house also fixes his. So it was th through the most weird conduits. And he said, you, sh you should do Patrick, he'd do one for you. Here's his number. So I ring up, hello, it's Robert, is that Sir Patrick? I was like, that. I was so nervous when I went to see him. And he was lovely, he made me a cup of tea and he was very nice. So I had amazing experiences meeting all those people. That show then got picked up by UK TV, which was absolutely not what I wanted to happen with it. The whole point of that was that it was outside the traditional television industry, that I didn't, I never went to a meeting in an office with a person in a suit who went, I don't know if it's really interesting, two people sitting in a car. Where's the gags? You know, there would be all those things. This was the most simple, pared down way of, of, of producing this stuff. There was no, no fiddly bits. And they immediately wanted to make it into a celebrity taxi service where I was an out of work ex TV star that had, was running a taxi and picked up celebrities in a You know, it's just like, oh God, this is going to be a nightmare. Eventually I managed to hold on to it so it was just exactly as it is on the internet. And it went on, Dave, and it was quite successful. They still repeat it. But I don't like telling UK TV that actually more people watch it online than have ever watched it on the telly, which is interesting. So the total aggregated figures for Carpool are now over 11 million uh, downloads in total on YouTube and iTunes. So it's done, it's had a very big uh, impact. It's, it's still going. I've just recorded a new one fairly recently and we're, we're, we're going to be releasing more soon. Um, I think there's an important person I do, yes, I should mention him because it is so much to do with the technology and the, and the, the, the idea of it. So when I was in, I spent a lot of time working in California in the last uh, 15 years. One of the people I met there is a man my age called Leo Laporte, uh, who, is a, who did a, a series on the TV, regular TV for many years called the te Tech TV, I think it was, and it was the most nerdy computer gadgety TV show and he would look at, uh, he'd t show you how to change your batteries on your laptop or how to upgrade your memory and he would sort of do it on TV and he's a very personable guy, very talkative, very funny, runs, does radio shows as well. But that t TV company, the whole company that did that uh, TV show uh, went bankrupt, closed down, he was, he was out of a job and he started doing a, a, a podcast uh, from his spare bedroom in his house in California Literally just him on a microphone going, hi, Leo Laporte here. And he's got one of those great American voices. Hi, I'm Leo Laporte, and this is Twit TV. And he did this show called Twit, which is This Week in Tech. And it's sort of nerdy stuff about the latest Samsung phone or whether, whether, is the iPhone good or is it rubbish and does the finger, finger, uh, fingerprint thing work and all that stuff. So it's very nerdy stuff. He went from uh, about 400 people a week watching it. He's now, the, that company now turns over uh, about $60 million a year, Twit. Uh, he has his own studio that he's built himself. He, uh, it, it's the most extraordinary setup. And I met him when he first started. He'd been doing it about two years. And he said, look, there's one thing I can tell you about podcasts. When you do one, just do another and another and another. And their, their big, uh, the, the sort of podcaster's mantra, if you like, is if you build it, they will come, which is, comes from the movie Field of Dreams uh, starring Kevin Costner. And that is what they all said. And that is what it was proven to me beyond
beyond a shadow of a doubt that once I started making carpool in particular, and I, if I did it every single week, every week the figures would go up. So, the, so you could have someone really famous and they'd get 20,000 views. And then the next week I'd put, put on a guy who was a, a, you know, a butcher but had developed a new electric bicycle. So no one had ever heard of him. And he got 22,000 views. But by that time the famous person who was on the week before had 45,000 views. And it was quite interesting to see that and to have those statistics and that feedback from YouTube was a completely different experience from traditional telly where you do a TV show and people would tell you, yeah, it did really well. It got 4.6% of medium of viewers on, you know, the, 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 the figures that they get on traditional TV are such bullshit. I think that's the only way of describing it and impossible to understand. Um, I, I'm la I, I, because I'd very much like to have questions from you, and I hope you've got some, because I, I, I don't know what you want to know. But uh, one person I do want to talk about is Charlie McDonald. So Charlie McDonald was the youngest ever passenger in carpool, and some of the comments under the uh, episode that I recorded with him are mm. quite disturbing, because it's basically an old bloke driving around outside a railway station, and a 17-year-old, quite attractive young man gets in the car with him. And there's a lot of people sort of read into that, some sort of weird, pervy stuff. I'd like to point out that wasn't the case, but uh, Charlie McDonald is a, a YouTube superstar. And when I met him then, he had something like 10 million views of his videos on YouTube. He just passed, I think last week, 300 million views on YouTube. More people watch Charlie McDonald on YouTube than watch Newsnight. And this is one guy sitting in front of a camera who's a very sweet looking guy. Most of his viewers are girls between the age of 14 and 18 and men over 32. <laughs> which he doesn't, he's, Charlie is very heterosexual and he's got a lovely girlfriend and he finds that quite disturbing. He's quite a pretty young man and he has a lot of older male admirers, which is marvellous. But I think that is extraordinary. He's, he makes a very good living out of it. When he, when, all, when he was at college and all his mates were working at Starbucks, he'd do a couple of YouTube videos and he earned embarrassingly larger amounts of money than the guys who worked at Starbucks. Uh, he's done, since done things like, uh, you know, parachute jumps where he's got a camera on his head. And I just think, oh, God, I couldn't do that. But uh, he, we are now working on a show together because he can't drive. He's going to learn to drive in my electric car. And I'm, so I'm being his dad, t taking him on his first driving lessons. And the insurance to get a 22-year-old, as he is now, insured to drive, a learner to drive your car, let me tell you, it's horrendous. But we'll get there. Uh, but I just think he was, he was the first person I met of this sort of new generation, of your generation, really, of uh, young people who had just grabbed that system and, and made uh, an amazing thing. And I mean, I, when I watch his videos, I, they, they don't do a great deal for me. I mean, I think they're funny, and he's quite a witty guy, and he does interesting stuff. And they're very, very personal. They're very revealing of his life and his, in, his insecurities and things like that. And he gets people to ask him to do stuff. So he's done one where he was painted green. So there's a whole one where he's, he's just green. There's another one which he did a little podcast where he was naked. And you only see his head and shoulders. And that's the one I remembered that he'd just done before I met him. Because he's sitting in front of this camera, clearly in his bedroom of his parental home. And he's going, it feels a bit awkward because I'm completely naked. And you can hear off in the distance behind a door, Charlie, tea's ready. You know, <laughs> and you go, oh, that, I can remember that, being naked in my room and my mum calling up, that's awkward. And then you hear, pop, 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 as he's carrying on talking. And then the, the door opens and it's, it's Charlie, what? Oh, what are you doing? You don't see it, you just hear his mum. <laughs> his mum walks into his bedroom and there's a boy sitting naked in front of a camera. And it's just, and that's when it cuts. And so it's very, very sweet stuff. But um, yeah, so that's. I don't know what else to tell you. I would love you to ask, uh, if you've got any questions, I don't know if I can answer them, but I can certainly try. <sighs> oh, good. How did that guy make money off his YouTube channel? Charlie, oh, from, from uh, <coughs> advertising. So, I mean, I, I make, uh, 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 I don't know, but about five or six hundred pounds a month from the advertising revenue from my YouTube video. I haven't put any new ones up yet. I mean, it would go up if I put some new ones up, which I'm about to do. No, you can no. That, that's that's done within the terms of service of YouTube. You have to actively stop them advertising on your thing. So you need to set up an account with them, and uh, um, it's a you, you get basically yeah. I mean, essentially the way Google operates. So if you think it's a free service, you don't have to pay for the bandwidth. You don't have to pay to put it up there, and Google are making gazillions of dollars every day, and they give you just a tiny little sliver off the corner of it. So. It's a fraction, it's a tiny amount. But once you start getting 
as in Charlie's case, you know, if you say you have 100,000 views on a video, you might get a couple of hundred quid. If you have 7 million views, which is what he, that's the kind of figures he, or 10 million views, and that's when it starts to become actual countable money that you can put in the bank and... How much, what, how much would you get for something like that? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's tens of thousands. So he's, on, he's earning hundreds of thousands of pounds a year. I mean, he's earning a lot of money, yeah. For a guy his age, it's extraordinary. How long it'll last is anyone's guess, and that's the stress now, because he's been doing it quite a few years. So um, the, the other, I mean, the way I do it now, so I'm doing a new series of, I do a series called Fully Charged, which is about electric vehicles and renewable energy and all the related topics to that, and that is sponsored. So last year I was sponsored by one of the big six, by British Gas, so I was rather compromised in what I could say. This year I'm sponsored by a very radical young energy company called Ecotricity who have a very different attitude um, to, uh, which fits in with what I'm doing much more. So that is how I can pay for that. Because once you're doing, you know, carpool was very cheap to make. That was the whole idea of it because it was literally, I'm in a car with two cameras, I don't have to do anything, There's, I don't need anybody else. Uh, fully charged immediately. I need cameramen. I need to help have some help organising it. There's some, you know, I'm, go I'm off to Barcelona soon to film a car there. You get sort of, you do kind of travel around. So I've travelled all over the world through that show, um, seeing different things, and that's a complete. That's that costs money. So I couldn't do that as a sort of, you know, l l just off advertising revenues from from YouTube. It does need a bit of backing. But I mean, certainly if you're on your own and you, and you can find that way of doing it. I mean, the, the numbers of Charlie McDonald's on, in the YouTube universe are, are minuscule. There's, there's a, maybe a dozen people in this country and a hundred in America that get those kind of figures. Uh, which is when you can start kind of actually earning a living from directly just from YouTube. But that, that, that is quite unusual. I mean, it's, I, I, I mean, what, what, because what I was sort of, I didn't explain well, but what I was hoping to explain was how exciting it was to work, to, to not work in television back in sort of the early 80s, because it was such a, it felt like, uh, to an outsider like me, it's such a closed shop. I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, and and, and, it, and at that stage, I mean, it's less so now, but the BBC in particular is still a bit like that. The, the BBC and the Foreign Office, the, the management in the BBC <coughs> and the foreign, foreign Office is about 98% white male Oxbridge. So that kind of closes down some gates. So if you've been to o Oxford and you, uh, and I've talked in some of the Oxbridge colleges uh, in the past to, uh, to a young man who's terribly well informed about how the BBC works. Three years later, I'm doing a radio play and I find out he's the producer. So in those three years, he's gone, he's got a job at the BBC, he knows exactly how it works. I haven't got a clue how it works. I mean, it just was a total mystery. Um, uh, so in the sense of being able to make something like that, in a sense, the, the, the being able to do online video is the same as doing, if you like, fringe theatre or alternative comedy was back then. You know, the, it, was a, it was an open market. You could do what you like. You could say, it, say what you liked. You know, you had control over what you were doing. Whereas at that stage, it, there was also far less channels. I mean, the, the, some of the early stuff I did on Channel 4... If that had been, if that was, if we got the same viewing figures that those shows had, it would be a hit. I mean, uh, the 4.8 million people watched the first episode of The Corner House. That that today would be a massive, massive. Everyone would have heard about it because you know, it was such a big success. It didn't make any impression because the second week it was 1.2 million and the third week it was about eight. Because once they realised how rubbish it was, they didn't watch it. But. Um, you know, so there was less channels. So I mean, Red Dwarf got uh, just short of 10 million view viewers in the last series we did, which was 98, when there were still really only five channels even then. Uh, and so that's changed the landscape in television a lot and the income. I mean, I, now looking back, I can see, God, we were really well paid uh, when we were work doing television back then because there wasn't anything else to watch. <laughs> so you had the kind of, you had the, a monopoly on the market. Whereas now we get paid a third now doing Red Dwarf of what we got paid in 1998. That's our, our fee is a third of what we used to get. And that's considered good. We can, you know, other actors tell me, God, you're bloody lucky you get that. Because it's, it's, so it was a very well paid, but tiny, tiny group of people that could, could work in it. So it's much more open now. It's much more likely, you, I think, you could make something for a, a, a regular TV channel or a cable channel or a satellite channel except nobody, less and less people can see it because it's 
spread out, so it is more like YouTube. So in a sense, I, I would argue that the way to go is to, you know, not necessarily on your own, but with a group of you to set up something that you do your own thing and keep it going and build it slowly. And that does definitely is the repetition is the is the key that I've learned, that if you just do one amazing video and it's fantastic, oh, come and have a look at this, and 86 people watch it and 120 watch it, and that's it. And then it kind of goes... <laughs> but if you did another amazing video the next week and the next week and the next week and the, for, for two years, then tens of thousands of people, or if it's good, will, will find it and watch it and go, oh, you should see this. They come out with a new one every week. It's worth... Keep, and they subscribe and that, you know, that, that pattern and that system does seem to work. Having the subscribers makes a big difference. I mean, I've got uh, 11,500 subscribers on uh, fully charged, or 12, I think it's just gone up. And, and that means that when you put, put a video, a lot of people see it straight away. They, it'll come up on their list and they'll see it. Uh, Carpool's the same, it has a lot of subscribers. That really, and iTunes. I really like iTunes. iTunes gets a lot of, because it's sort of hidden away. Everyone's sort of very aware of YouTube, but iTunes, I find, is uh, a sort of hidden gem. Because I don't use it now. I, I watch everything on YouTube. <laughs> but there was a time when I'd download stuff on iTunes and watch it on my phone because it was so modern. For me, it was modern. It was normal for you guys. <laughs> oh, yes, at the back, sorry. Uh, how was it working on uh, Ash's request for game Charlie? How is this like internet only still? Yeah, I mean, that was, well, I was really intrigued. I mean, the actual process. So, for those of you, I don't know, I don't know how many of you know about this, but this was a crowd funded. Uh, YouTube only feature film uh, a guy called Stuart Ashens who, who had a very successful YouTube channel where he looks at the naffest crappest plastic toys from the 1980s which he would have had when he was a kid but not the real ones it, they're, they're the fake ones <laughs> so, and so the game child was a was a fake game boy that didn't work and I think his auntie gave it to him at Christmas and so the the movie was about his search for the last remaining game child and I played his lecherous old professor. I don't know why I was cast as that. But, um, but the actual process of shooting it was exactly like doing a TV show. So it was a camera crew in a studio with a set, with people with clipboards keeping track of everything. That side of it was like doing a TV show or a film. But the, the process of how it came to be was very different. And the, and the uh, response it got, I think, has been really encouraging. I mean, and he's, he's a very sweet... Funny guy. A lot of people compare him to Simon Pegg, don't they? They say, and he's got a very—he sort of underplays it very well. Um, I thought it was amazing. I mean, it's a, a, and a really interesting way of doing it because the, the, my generation of filmmakers and TV producers would find that absolutely appalling—that you put all that effort into something and then you just give it away because their whole system of doing things is that you make something and you hold on to it and you don't let people see it and you let release the DVD but then you don't and then you know all that stuff and they it, it, all they worry about is piracy 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 and I said look mate if your show is being pirated that means it's quite good <laughs> that's quite a good you know it's when your show isn't pirated and nobody's watching it that means it's rubbish so if the corner house had come out now it would no one would pirate that they wouldn't bother, you know. You'd find that on, on, the, on a bit torrent. You go, oh, I won't, waste, I won't waste my bandwidth on that rubbish, you know. So the shows that are successful, and it's certainly the way Netflix work. Netflix keep an eye on the movies that are pirated the most, and that's what they buy into the Netflix thing. It is, I mean, it's thrown the industry into a, a tailspin, you know. No one really knows how to deal with it. And, and I think that's one of the feelings I get now, is that my entire career in old-school telly I was wandering around like a headless chicken. I had no idea who did what job, what the job meant. The first assistant commissioning editor. Hi, my name's Dave, first assistant commissioning editor, BBC Light Ends. What the fuck does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> and I didn't know whether he was a twat or, or, I, or I should be nice to him. I didn't know whether he could give me a job or he's just a tosser, you know. And he looked like a tosser and he spoke like one, but I didn't know. Now, he hasn't got a clue what's going on. No one has got a clue. The man in the most flash suit who earns £100,000 a year hasn't got a fucking clue what's going on, and nor have I. And we're absolutely on a level playing field, and it's much more fun. And boy, do I take the piss out of them. It's fantastic fun. Yes? Uh, you said earlier that you know, the Twit guy and you have this mantra, if you make something, make it again. Yeah. If you keep doing it, people will get that. Um, do you have any other mantras that you kind of stick to aside from kind of repetition? I mean, the one that I've tried to live my life by, uh, which, is, which is attributed to Bob Dylan, although I've got a feeling he denied he ever said it, is to live outside the law, you must be honest, 
which I think is quite a good one. So if, and I don't necessarily, and I, th- and I haven't taken it to mean to live outside the law, i.e. to be a bank robber, <laughs> to be a really honest bank robber or murderer, but to live outside the regular system of how, this is how you do it, you go to, you go to college and then you, go to, you do drama and then you do television and then you're Stephen Fry. You know, that is one way you can do it. And he's proven that, that it worked very well. Uh, and so to work around that and to, to find your own furrow, honest, you've got to be honest with yourself and with whoever you're speaking to so that honesty is quite can be quite difficult and painful and awkward and when you're sponsored by British Gas which is owned by one of the most rapacious energy companies on the planet you know there's there's pieces to camera that I do on that series where my hands are like this because <laughs> it's because I know what's really going on you know quadrilla are just about to frack the shit out of this country and I'm and I'm sort of supporting them so it was very nice when that particular bit of very nice the people I met at British Gas the actual engineers and the people I met were all lovely it wasn't the, it's not a personal thing it's just the company is a bit nightmarish um, so that that it, you know you're constantly faced with those kind of dilemmas where I can't make this show without them but I am making it with them and I am therefore a running dog whore of capitalist oppression you know but I'm used to that yes um, you've explained how you've moved away from television and moved on to the internet and um, YouTube and all that. And um, I was just wondering, personally, would you say that television is sort of coming to the end of its days and that the internet is the way forward? Or that- no, I don't think it is. And I think uh, there was a time a few years ago when I hoped that was the case because I'd had such a sort of weird battle with television. But, I mean, I think that, uh, that television will change in a way that is hard to imagine. I mean, I think it's a, a, a really important change that I've seen in the time I've been involved. So when I was doing the Joeys, the group, the theatre group I was telling you about earlier on, about 1983, um, a producer saw one of the shows we did and he asked me specifically out of the group, so there's four of us and we were very egalitarian, and he asked me if, uh, to, be, to come and audition to be in a BBC drama. Uh, uh, and, I, and I didn't really want to do it, but I wasn't sure. And then my mate said, you've got to do it, man. You've got to take the opportunity. Yeah, it's cool. So I went to this meeting at the BBC and there was four men sitting behind a table and at the end there was a woman with a notepad and another woman came in and gave me a cup of tea and these four men were the guys who were the producer and the director and the writer and the da da and uh, I talked to them and it, I didn't do it I said no and they said you'll never work again and I said that's fine because I don't want to work with you and that was fine I never did work with them but then say jump ten years ahead in the similar situations where I was meeting people at the BBC there were four women behind that table and there was one gay man at the end with a notepad who was called Graham and he was lovely and he said, do you want to come and see? Do you want to see? Do you want to see? And that was how it, the, the women had completely changed. The, 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 BBC is, the BBC production is almost entirely run by women. And if you think of what telly was like when you were tiny toddlers and little kids, it was, I mean, Top Gear was normal as opposed to being a freak show of misogyny and racism that it is now. That was normal. So everything was a freak show of misogyny and racism. Uh, uh, you know, and, the, and, and now it's cooking, baking, uh, clothes, fashion, competitions about singing. It's basically television that I would honestly rather saw the front of my head off than have anything to do with. I don't want to see it. I don't want to know it happens. When I run past the room in our house with the telly on and my wife and daughter are watching <coughs> that, twat with the high-waisted trousers judging some kid who's singing I just have to go ah, 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 as I walk past because I find it fucking vile but it's hugely successful hugely successful and people lap it up by the gallon the bake-off I know the whole crew that make the bake-off used to make scrap heap, so I've heard more about fucking bake-off than I've ever wanted to I knew who'd won and I didn't tell anyone because I wasn't interested <laughs> I knew who'd won before they won it god Jesus. Anyway, no, baking is marvellous. So that's so for a bloke, <laughs> it's all lovely, and they're all lovely, and they're all and they're all wonderful. It's fun, fantastic. We actually were there. They did. They shot the pilot of that quite near where we live, and I went to see. We went out to um, for a meal with all the crew, and it was funny. And I was so relieved I wasn't wasn't involved because the the stress on the very first one. None of the ovens worked. One of the people who was baking burst into tears and ran off, and they never saw them again ever. <laughs> And it all went hideously wrong, and you thought, this won't work, and they'll look at us. So, but, so I, I think television is extremely healthy. I think it'll, it won't disappear. The, 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 it's doing very well. Commercial television is doing extremely well at the moment. They're making loads of money, so the, and they're investing. And the ITV's investment in drama, I think, is amazing, even though I would also rather saw the back of my head off than watch Downton Abbey. But it's still brilliant that they do it. I think it's very good. Um, uh, but I think what's happening is that, the in, for me, the interesting stuff... And the, and the archive 
nature of things like YouTube are fascinating. And, and, the, and the, the sheer number of people who watch that on a daily basis is in, the, is in the tens of billions. You know, the amount of views that YouTube gets is, is phenomenal. And that is, I think it's going to be, they'll, they'll both thrive. I don't think that conventional broadcast television, I think it will change in the sense that I would say the person whose job is most at risk in a television company is the scheduler. You can imagine if you're a scheduler and you're working out the schedule. When are we going to show Bake Off and what is it up against? Those people talk for hours about what, you know, we should put this, well, let's put that up against Top Gear because then we'll steal some of their audience. And you just think, no, you guys, because I don't watch telly. I watch iPlayer when, I want it, when it's convenient for me to watch it. It's not, on. I don't want to watch it at eight when some pillock in an office tells me it's on at eight. Why? Why is it eight? I don't care. I can't watch telly at eight. I'm busy. I'm washing up. I'm cleaning up the mess my kids have made. I'm not going to watch telly then, but I want to watch that show. So I watch it at 10. 30. So scheduling is annoying, but it's appointment television. That's what we call it. We call it appointment television. We all want to watch those people baking cakes at the same time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I've got to be careful. I mustn't say too many rude things about normal telly. Sorry, yes. <laughs> um, work like sort of in front of the camera, behind the camera, on the TV, on the web. Where have you had the most fun? I mean, in terms of, of gut-wrenching, hysterical laughs per minute, I'm afraid it's Red Dwarf. I mean, the cast of Red Dwarf are such, you know, we've worked together for so long that they, and in fact, quite often, Craig Charles, uh, you know, he just makes me laugh. He doesn't have to do anything. If he stands up, it's funny. <laughs> and if, it's not just him standing up. If he stands up and Chris Barry's looking at him as he stands up and I'm behind them, that's funny. I don't know why, because Craig stands up. Craig, yeah, I'm standing up. And Chris is going... Why is he standing up? <laughs> it's just, I just crack up. I'm in hysterics. And then Danny starts doing a dance. Why? He starts doing a fucking pirouette. It's ridiculous. In the middle of a show. When he's, not, he's, not, he's got a line to do and he's forgotten it. He does a pirouette and a little jeté. It, we just have such fun doing that show. And it's the most uncomfortable. I mean, I've always said you, uh, the, 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 the prison authorities should use full, full face prosthetics as a punishment, particularly for sex offenders. Because, I mean, you would know, wouldn't you? If a walk guy walked down and he had a yellow head, the, the shape of a banana, you'd know that... And it, he's allowed out in the community as long as he wears this funny head. And he's like, oh, 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 like that, you know. Because like, let me tell you, if there's one thing that will kill a, a libido, it's a full-face prosthetic. <laughs> I've tried with um, uh, Chloe Annette, who played Kachansky in Red Dwarf. She showed me her pants to see if it got me... And she's gorgeous. I mean, let's face it, she's gorgeous. She came in and lifted her dressing gown in between takes and I had my red, I had my Crichton head on, pair of pants, socks, and I, uh, sitting in waiting, to, uh, and nothing, not a flicker. Tragic, <laughs> tragic. It's the, the best safeguard, I think. So I, I would, you know, you'd be condemned for three years in full head prosthetic makeup. You'd never do anything wrong again. <laughs> it's the ultimate punishment. So it is very uncomfortable, but it's great. It is enormous fun. So from a sort of sheer laugh per minute, uh, Red Dwarf is very hard to beat. Um, you know, for, for amazing, like, uh, on, on traditional telly, you know, doing Scrap Heap, I was so lucky to do that show. Just to, the, some of the engineers that worked on that were just inspiring human beings, you know. And some of the specialists we had on were, were amazing people. And that was a tremendous opportunity. And, I mean, I worked in America a lot doing that, which was fantastic. And a lot of the stuff I've got interested in electric cars was from being in California and being given lift rides in experimental high-performance electric vehicles that made your bottom fall out because they went so fast. Um, you know, so really, you know, very, I've been very lucky in those terms. Um, and then actually I did a series for Channel 5 called How Do They Do It, which I was kind of, I really um denied about doing. And, I, and, and annoyingly, I found it absolutely fascinating like going to the Lipton's Tea Factory. You just, when I woke up that morning, I thought, what, this is going to be the dullest day of my life. I'm going to a tea factory to see how they mix tea and make tea bags. It was brilliant. <laughs> the tea bag making machine at Lipton's is just a joy. It's like a piece of kinetic art. It's wonderful to watch. I sat, sat there for hours. I had to be dragged away. The director had to drag me away because I was just sitting looking at this machine going, tick -tick 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 -tick, making little tea bags. It was so cute. <laughs> so, you know, weird stuff like that. That's fun. But I mean, I think from the point of view of sort of personal satisfaction, you know, the first time I passed a million views on, on, uh, on Carpool. I burst into tears and told my missus. I said, look, a million bacon, I can't believe it. Because that was, that was completely my thing. You know, there was no one else involved other than the rather nice people who'd agreed to 
go in my car, but you know, that was a, a, a special moment. Where's out? Two million, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, so yeah, laughs, Red Dwarf. Ter- uh, I suppose terror, uh, Scrap Heap and how do they do it? Because um, uh, there is some footage on YouTube, which the cameraman put up, which is very cruel, of um, uh, me flying in a, a Red Bull aerobatic plane. Uh, where, and I, that's another, I, had, I, I discovered I had airborne Tourette's. Because this is, uh, how, how do they do it? It's like early evening lads and dads television, they call it. So, you know, they, you don't swear, which is fine. I don't, you know. But all I did once that plane started doing weird shit was swear. I didn't do any joining words. It's just obscenities. So the whole thing, all the footage of me is just my whole mouth pixelated. The, you can see the world in the background going like that behind the, <laughs> as the plane's going <laughs> like that. And it's just, ah, <laughs> fuck so I don't get air sick or seasick. I've learnt that, but it's not nice. And I, it's very unpleasant. Yeah, so if you ever get the chance to go in a Red Bull aerobatic plane for a fun ride, don't do it. Just don't. <laughs> Just don't get in them. They're ridiculous. Terrifying. Yes, sir? Um, in today's kind of climate, is it more important to be almost a master of one trade or a jack of all? It's so hard, isn't it? I don't know. I think... It's very hard to be a jack. I mean, because I, 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 I want a new phrase. You know, when you're a jack of all trades, it kind of means you sort of do everything, but you're not very... I want it to be, you do everything and you're really crap at it. You know, I need... So, so it's like a tosser at, at all. You know, it's like I'm not very good at any of them. So that's the... You know, a jack of all trades means... It sounds like... I, I think of a man who's a jack of all trades as a pretty confident guy that can get down and sort stuff out, <laughs> as opposed to someone going, ah, 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 which is what, how I operate most of the time. Um... But, I mean, when I think of sort of people who work in the industry that have been successful, that I've known for a long time, that are, you know, cameramen and camera operators, um, uh, and they, that's what they do, and they're really good at it, and they work all the time. My nephew uh, is now 33, and he started out as a, it was the only time I've done nepotism, but I got him a job as a runner, unpaid, on uh, Scrap Heap, and he was so good, they all liked him, and they hired him the following year, and he was a, 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 a college at the time. Uh, and since then, he's never stopped working. So he's a, he is a cameraman, producer, director. So he, he flies all over the world, mainly for National Geographic now, with a, a mate. I'm really jealous of his rucksack because it's, it's a National Geographic full-on sort of military field rucksack. So it's got camera, laptop, hard drives, uh, fucking um, satellite data link stuff, really posh stuff. And he gets it all out. It's really cool. He can send data over via satellite to, dis- to the Discovery Channel, whoever it is. But he worked with, um, who's the angry ex-footballing chef, shouty man? Uh, Gordon Ramsay. He, he was, <laughs> he, was uh, he, he filmed Gordon Ramsay for a long time. And he, he was just, like when Gordon Ramsay did things like fishing for sardines off the coast of Crete or something, then that footage was all shot by my nephew, Ben, who's a lovely lad, and he's done really well. So he's focused down, but even then, he is now, and that seems to be quite common, that it used to, that would normally have been a crew. Even five years ago, that would have been a crew. Sound engineer, camera operator, editor, producer, researcher, you know, runner. That would have been how one camera would have filmed Gordon Ramsay. Now it's literally one person, and he's uploading that footage, cutting it together, sending it off, sending off the rough cut to wherever. Very different world. So, uh, but he, he's, he's loving it, you know, I mean, he's having a good time. It's exhausting. He's having a, a week off at the moment, or two weeks off, I think. So, I don't know, I don't know, because he's sort of specialised in that. I don't, I, I really can't answer that, I don't know. A tosser of all trades sounds appealing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, bear that in mind. put that on your CV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't put tosser of all trades on your CV, that's not a good idea. I haven't got a CV. I mean, that, you know, I, didn't, I wouldn't know how to do one. I, I've, been, uh, I, I've helped other people write their CVs. And I, I'm quite good at it. I, make it. I made them look really good. But I don't know. I have not got one. I was just that old bloke. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> what have you done? I'm just that old bloke. <laughs> I don't know. Any other questions? Yes. Have you ever considered... Yeah, yes, but I don't know, because I've been on lots of other people's podcasts. It's a lot of work, and that's, a, you know, that, and that's also 
I think that's the problem I have is the set time, because that you need to do at the set time, which is what Leo, the guy I was telling you about, Leo Laporte, does, has set times. That's his job. He does, he's three o'clock. It's this week in Google. And he gets all his Google people in. You know, he does all these different shows. Well, I'm, I'm all over the place. I mean, I don't know where. I mean, I'm driving around Brands Hatch tomorrow in an electric BMW, you know. And, I, and then if I had a show at three o'clock on a Tuesday, I'd go, oh, God, well, I can't do that. So I'm, that's really, it's being tied down to, to that sort of specific time, I think, is what stopped me doing that. Because I'd quite like to do it, because you could do it from home. I mean, there's a, a couple of podcasts that I appear on every now and then. Uh, that are set times, and if I can do it, I'll, I'll join in. And I do it from home, and I've got a little studio set up. It's pretty naff, but a microphone, and it sounds... It actually sounds fine. <laughs> it doesn't sound any different than if you're in broadcasting house, you know. So That stuff is incredible, because that was utterly impossible uh, when I was your age. It was impossible, you know. We, we, I used to make comedy radio shows with a mate in the village I lived in on a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which was, like, really pro. And we do sound effects. But, you know, then we had a reel-to-reel -reel tape. No one else heard it. You know, and that, some of that stuff was quite funny, I think. We, th we thought it was hysterical. So, you know, you've got that, is, that change is so exciting that you've got that ability to send that out. Even if it's not working out with it, you keep doing it and you'll learn. You know, that's how you, how you get there. Any other question? I'd love a question from a woman. Not for any dodgy, weird, freaky, old bloke, <laughs> kinky reason, just... <laughs> I'm not going to get one, am I? <laughs> what are you on about, you grubby old bloke? I think would be the best comment I could hope for. Right, well, um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's been very useful, very interesting uh, and enjoyable talk. Um, so, and I say thank you very much, Rob. Well, oh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.